Did we pray already? Maybe I should pray again. <laughs> oh my. No, I, I, I love this church. And God has a great uh, work for us here as he does in, in all the churches as well. So just as the pastor, we'd love to have you explore being a part of our active church ministry. Kingdom mentality is the title of my sermon today. Um, kingdom thinking, kingdom focus, having a kingdom uh, uh, outlook on how we live our lives. That's what I want to talk about today. And uh, we'll see how see how the Lord leads. Oh, it didn't come through too good. Question number one. If you want to help out during the kids' quiz, just raise your hand and I'll call on you. Who became the king of Israel after King David? Okay, I saw your hand jump up here. That's right. It was his son Solomon. His son Solomon. It was not the oldest of David's sons. Um, he was not from the one of the earlier marriages of King David. It was quite a series of events that the Lord directed to make Solomon the son of David who would be king after David would pass away. Question number two. What famous question does God ask Solomon in a dream? You remember this one? All right, I saw your hand right here. Basically, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's technically grammatically not a question, but it's kind of that almost genie in a bottle thing. God says, what do you want me to do for you? Ask what you wish me to give you. It's kind of that whatever you want, uh, I'm making that offer. It's an incredibly unique thing in Scripture. It was uh, for a specific reason in this juncture in Solomon's uh, uh, reign as he's consolidating power. It was a time to, for God really to test the heart of Solomon and for Solomon to make a determination of what he wanted out of his relationship with God. We're going to look at that a little bit. So what did King Solomon ask for? He says, man, I really want to have muscles. I really want to have the best house. What do you say, Toby? You guys are sharp today. He asked for wisdom or discernment or an understanding heart or good judgment. That seems, sounds like a, a pretty good thing to ask for, doesn't it? Doesn't it already take kind of a wise person to ask that? You know, it's kind of one of those things. He obviously already had a certain level of wisdom to ask that, and that and God honored that, and uh, God responded with, with uh, appreciation for that. But yep, that's what he asked for, wisdom. So using that wisdom, God led Solomon to write some of the books of the Bible. So the fourth question is, what books of the Bible did Solomon write or principally write? I, I do recall asking for hands to go up. Maybe I missed that, but... Um, Okay, I've had it. You guys have done one before. I'm going to come to Caleb here. We'll see, and then we'll come to you, ladies. Caleb. He did write Proverbs. All right, was that the one you guys were going to say? All right, back here. He did write Song, uh, well, yeah, Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. That's right. And then there's one more. All right, Leah. Ecclesiastes. Those are the three books that uh, I thought of for the most part. Proverbs. There's a few others that contribute to some of the Proverbs that are in the book of Proverbs. Song of Songs or Canticles or Song of Solomon. This one has a lot of titles. The most controversial uh, book by far of the Old Testament is Song of Songs. It, it really, the rabbis and scholars went back and forth. There were two schools of thought. One did not want the Song of Solomon to be considered uh, canonical, uh, uh, and the, another group wanted it, and so it ended up in our Bibles. It's a very interesting book, and we're not going to talk about that right now. And then Ecclesiastes as well, also unique in its portrayal of an aged, wise man reflecting on his life and his errors and, and things that we can learn from that. Uh, so all are given to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, through the pen of Solomon. Last question. Why is Jesus also called the son of David? So Solomon was the son of David, and Jesus comes and regularly is called Jesus, son of David. Did I see Jonathan's hand go up? Jonathan. Okay, so in a literal sense, yes, he is a descendant from the lineage uh, of David. So th there is some uh, application there, absolutely. So that's part of it. He, you know, could say, yes, I have a blood connection there. There's more to it than that. I'd like to have a couple others weigh in. Yeah.
Okay. So he kind of followed it in the character of David. Is that, is that what you're suggesting? So he kind of had the, okay, yeah, sure. He, he kind of uh, had the same uh, uh, devotion to God and was uh, beloved of the Lord in, in that sense. Anyone else of, of the young people? Why? Have you ever read that in the Bible? Jesus, son of David. He's called that. Do you have any other ideas of why he would be called that? All these are good answers, all right answers. Okay. Well, this is what I write. Because he, like Solomon, was the wise king who came after David. And Solomon's name means prince. And Jesus was, or excuse me, his name means peace. Shalom, right? Solomon, shalom. Uh, his name means peace. And Jesus was the prince of peace. But there's a lot more to it prophetically and, and everything else of why Jesus came as the son of David. We're going to be talking a little bit about Solomon and Jesus and some of these things when we think about what it means to have a kingdom mentality. So that's why I brought us to this story and to um, Solomon in his interactions with God. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be reading from 1 Kings chapter 3. And uh, the passage uh, specifically begins in verse 5. But I think it's of, of, of value to acknowledge the, the context and the circumstances by which this story takes place. This is early on in Solomon consolidating his reign as, as king. This is not 10 years or, or 20 years into his reign. This is very much as David has recently died, and there's been infighting among the sons of David of who would take over. Solomon is not a perfect guy, and, and Kings makes this very clear in how it describes uh, the transition of power um, some of these things were uh, ordained by God and, and pro prophesied that Solomon would be uh, the king to follow David. But Solomon has just recently in the infighting had his older brother executed. All right. His older brother is Adonijah, whose name means Yahweh is the Lord or the Lord is Yahweh um, because of his uh, maneuverings and his uh, attempt to marry the young girl that had kept David warm in his old age. Uh, he also banishes the, the priest Abiathar, who had supported Adonijah. And he's also executed Joab, the old, rule, uh, the old military commander who had supported David, but then had also supported Adonijah. So this was not a smooth transition of power. All right, this had been bloody. This had been controversial. And a lot hinged on what Solomon would do. A lot for the kingdom of Israel would depend on how Solomon would move forward. So we pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 3. And I, again, even though I, I have verse 5, it's just important to note that the scripture identifies that Solomon was still uh, a learning and growing in his understanding and appreciation for the expectations of God. Because it begins, then Solomon formed a marriage alliance with uh, Pharaoh uh, by taking Pharaoh's daughter. Literally, it says, uh, Solomon made himself Pharaoh's son-in-law. Okay. And right at the outset, the, the, the Bible is leading us to understand that Solomon was already struggling because Solomon was already married at this point, and Mosaic law expressly forbid the king from having multiple wives. It also forb uh, expressly forbid them from having wives outside the faith. And we know that um, Solomon understood this later on because he builds uh, for the daughter of of Pharaoh, a palace outside of Jerusalem, and says, I don't think that she should be anywhere near where the ark is because the ark is holy. So that makes for a really fun marriage, doesn't it? <laughs> so you know that Solomon realizes that he simply made a political calculation here, and by, by acknowledging that he's become Pharaoh's son-in-law, he's also positioning himself to potentially one day be Pharaoh himself. Uh, that had the, uh, he had the opportunity by being Pharaoh's son-of-law of, of proclaiming himself to be the next Pharaoh. So he's making these calculations uh, as, as, as uh, Israel is on the ascendancy and other nations are finding their place. Then verse 2 says, The people were still sacrificing on the high places because there was no ho house built for the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon uh, loved the Lord. He walked as his dad had done uh, following the statutes, except... He sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. So here, because of his ignorance and naivety a little bit, and because of the lack of opportunity to worship, God acknowledges that Solomon was authentic, authentically wanting to worship God, but he was still doing it in a pagan way and in a pagan place. So this is, this is the context, but God is patient. God is gracious. He still loves Solomon, and he's working with Solomon with where he's at. And that's why Solomon is in the city of Gibeon, 
when this story begins in verse 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said to Solomon, ask what you wish me to give you. What would you say? What would you say? Ask what you wish me to give you. You've played that game before, the genie in the bottle thing. If you had three wishes, what would you wish for? And no wishing for more wishes, Jeff. Yeah, no wishing for more wishes. Put the kibosh, right? I mean, honestly, authentically, if you in a young juncture of your life, you felt God came to you and say, look, I've got the riches, I've got the power, I'm right here with you, just ask. You know, God invites us to ask him for his blessings. Uh, that's part of the song that we sing, ask and it shall be given to you, unto you, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be opened up to you. God may not have come to you in a dream like this, but God invites you to ask of him what it is that you want and need in your life. So have you done that recently? That's what God does here to Solomon. He says, ask what you wish me to give to you. And in his dream, in his dream, in a very dramatic and waking moment, he interacts with God. In verse 6, then Solomon said, you have shown great loving kindness to your servant David, my father, according as he walked before you in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart towards you. And you have reserved for him this great loving kindness that you've given him a son to sit on his throne as it is to this day. Now remember for a second, Solomon is the son of David through Bathsheba. Who is Bathsheba? Oh yeah, she's the girl that was married to the other guy that David, while Uriah is out fighting in David's wars, David stays back and takes his wife. And then David gets embarrassed when she gets pregnant and he says, you know, I'm not going to own up to this. I'm going to wash over it. Uriah, you go back out there to war and I'm going to have everyone retreat while you're fighting to make sure you're dead. So Solomon, in his, uh, in his prayer, looking at his father, he, remember, I pointed out the flaws of Solomon, and yet despite the flaws of Solomon, God's grace is there, God's willingness to work with that is there. God did the same thing with David. David was not perfect either. David had his flaws, but he repented, and he tried to make it right with the Lord, and God was gracious with him. So Solomon acknowledges the truth and righteousness and uprightness of God and of his father, David. Verse seven. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David, and speaking of himself. Yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Oh, there's, there's, it's just interesting. There's so many things that could be said of that. I just thought to me, he's already ordered the execution of his brother. He's already been banishing priests and doing, he's not exactly making childish decisions, is he? He's, he's, kind of, he's kind of making some pretty big decisions. But in this moment, in this dream, he humbles himself and he says, look, I still need you in a great and significant way because I am still immature in my mind and in my thinking. Verse 8, your servant is in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a great people, more than are able to be numbered or counted. So here it is, verse 9. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? This beautiful statement in the dream, again, of Solomon as he's interacting with the Lord in the dream, he makes this profound request. I need understanding. I need discernment. I need the ability to rule this people because I'm but a child, and without you, I am going to fail at that. Verse 10 says, It was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said to him, Because you've asked this thing, and have not asked for yourself long life, nor asked for riches for yourself, nor have asked yourself for life, asked uh, for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. I have given you a wise and discerning heart, so that there should be none like you before you, nor shall there any... Uh, like you arise after you, I've also given you what you've not asked. I'm going to give you riches and honor so that there will not be any among uh, the kings that like, like you all your days. If you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and commandments, as your father David walked, then I will prolong your days. And Solomon awoke, he, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, of the Lord and offered burnt offerings and made peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. Now you're probably somewhat familiar with this story if you've 
heard it before in, in, in different contexts, but it's just good to, to refresh ourselves with the, the words of Scripture about this. So God honors Solomon and says, because of, of your requests to have wisdom and discernment and ability to be a good king, I'm going to give to you the things you didn't ask for. I'm going to give you riches. I'm going to give you honor. I'm going to give you long life. But notice what specifically Solomon asks for. He didn't even ask for wisdom just for himself. He wasn't even really thinking of himself. Who was he thinking of? Give your servant an understanding heart to do what? To judge your people. Okay? To discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of yours. Do you, you notice that? So even his request for wisdom and discernment, it wasn't just so that everyone would say, oh, what, Solomon, you're so smart. Man, you're so wise. It was so that he could bless and lead and righteously and, and, and faithfully administer justice and leadership for God's people. Do you see that? He was thinking about God's people, not himself. And I think that's what pleased the Lord. And the Lord promised that because of that, he would give to him the things he didn't ask for himself. Now, I believe that this story is likely what Jesus was thinking about in the Sermon on the Mount when he said this, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I think Jesus was referencing and thinking and trying to draw our attention back to what Solomon had did. I think it's the same element of promise. I think it's the same circumstance of, of uh, what was happening when Solomon asked for wisdom. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's exactly what happened with Solomon. Because Solomon had put God's people, God's priorities, God's thinking first, God added unto him all the things that would make him sufficient and successful and comfortable and happy in life as long as he walked in the statutes of God. So I want to just spend a minute or two talking about this kingdom mentality, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. We say this a lot. We think this a lot. Uh, it's in music and songs and, and in poetry. What does it mean to seek his kingdom and his righteousness? What is meant by that? Let's start with the kingdom part. What is God's kingdom? And again, there's nothing wrong with us thinking in terms of the heavenly kingdom and the pearly gates and uh, uh, the streets of gold and the heavenly choir and the mansion over the hilltop. All those things are certainly beautiful things that are a part of God's plan for us where he's preparing a place for us. But there's more to the kingdom and scripture wants us to be aware of that. Here, I tried to squeeze that in. Oh, it came, came in all right. Luke 17, Jesus answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is where? Right here. And, and right here. Some of your Bibles might say the kingdom of God is within you. Okay? Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God here. Not the, again, not the glorious gems and the streets of gold and stuff, but the ideas, the ideals, the thinking, the family, the community, the character of the kingdom of God, he came and put right here in our midst. This is the kingdom of God. This people, this church, this family, this faith that we have together is the kingdom of God. Here in Revelation, it says something similar. He has made us to be a kingdom. We are the kingdom of God. Because of our faith, because of our allowance of God to change our lives, to redirect our priorities, to convert our hearts, to wash our sins clean. We have the privilege of saying we are his kingdom. Amen? Amen. Is the kingdom of God simply something that we're waiting for that will only come at the second coming? Or is the kingdom of God something that can be and is experienced every time we open our hearts to God and with one another? We get to experience just a little slice of heaven, don't we? If not, what are we doing here? This is the kingdom. He has made us to be a kingdom. Priests to God and to the Father, to Him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. It's because of him, because of what he's done for us, because of his creative and redemptive power. The kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. 
his people. His people. Secondly, his righteousness. And I want to read these verses from Romans. Um, we'll highlight just a couple of things here in a second. But in Romans chapter 3, I think Paul speaks to this. And uh, in, in, again, in verses that we may be familiar with. Romans 3, beginning in verse 23. For all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, but being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25. Whom He publicly displayed as a propitiation or as an offering or as a sacrifice in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness. There's that term, His righteousness. This was to demonstrate His righteousness. So God offering Jesus as a sacrifice in His blood demonstrated God's righteousness. Because of the forbearance of God, He passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness, says it again, at the present time, so that He would be the just, He would be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So what I'm suggesting to you here in Romans is Paul makes it clear. Now, righteousness obviously is a big theological term. You can read about it all over the Bible and the Psalms and, and everywhere. We talk about the righteousness of God. But Paul says that the highest pinnacle of the demonstration of the righteousness of God was when Jesus died on the cross. It wasn't just that he was right and upstanding and, and fulfilled the law and did everything that was right. You know, think of righteousness. It was that he gave himself for other people. That's his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his people, and his righteousness, a willingness to sacrifice for others. Do, do you see what I'm, where I'm going with this? What a kingdom mentality is? what a kingdom focus is, what made Solomon the son of David that God would be willing to lift him up and bless him with the wisdom and the riches and the glory that he gave is that Solomon had a kingdom mentality. He said, I want to be good for your people and I want to understand your plan for people and I'm willing to set aside my riches, my glory, so that your people will be safe and successful. And in the New Testament, Jesus, I think, echoing that same sentiment, says, if you want to understand what my people look like, if you want to understand what a son of David looks like, if you want to understand who I am as a son of David, you will have this same mentality. You will put God's people first in your lives to the point that you would be willing to sacrifice, even shed blood, that others might be saved. So just look at this. God's kingdom is God's people. God's righteousness is seen best in Christ's example of self-sacrifice. A kingdom mentality. There's a lot of things begging for our attention in our society right now. There's a lot of attitudes. There's a lot of opinions. There's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of rewriting of, of history. A lot of reinterpretation of, of natural uh, expression and of law and of, of social norms. And there are so many things trying to get into our minds to dictate to us about how we should think and how we should orient our lives. And I think one of the great challenges for the church in the last days is to stay rooted in this fundamental conviction that we will be devoted to God first and to God's people and that we will be willing to give of ourselves so that others might be saved. That is what a Christian is. Now, I know I've said this before, but it is just so fundamental to my understanding of, of our relationship with God. It, it, I, I would uh, feel myself com, uh, complete and, and successful uh, as a minister if everyone would take this sentiment to heart. Christianity is not giving up bad things so that you can be saved. That is not Christianity. That's not what Christ did. Christianity is not, oh, I'm not stealing and I'm not swearing and I'm not drinking and I'm not cheating. Uh, therefore, I'm a Christian. That is not Christianity. Christianity is not giving up bad things so that you can be saved. Christianity is giving up good things so that others can be saved. Do you see the difference? 
There's a world of different. By Mark Finley, I did not write that. I, it didn't come from me. I know you think I'm wise and wonderful, but I, I got to just keep things in context. I heard Mark Finley say that the first time, but I just think it's so pivotal. Christianity is not measured simply by us not doing bad things and then saying, that makes me a Christian. I did not go to that rated R movie. I did not listen to that bad music. I did not drink that bad thing or eat that bad thing. I, did all, I avoided all those bad things. Hallelujah, I'm going to heaven. Now, that's not a justification for doing bad things. But that's not what Christ, that's not what a son of David is. That's not what motivated Solomon. That's not what motivated Christ. Christ was not known for his avoidance of of sin. He was known for his willingness to do good for others. He was accused of healing on the Sabbath. He was accused of ministering to the outcast. He was accused of welcoming the tax collectors and the prostitutes. He was doing good things so that others can be saved. Let me ask you a question. Are you a Christian today? Are you a Christian because you've simply avoided bad things in your life? Or are you taking to heart a kingdom mentality and saying, I know that Christ is operating in my life and I'm willing to do good things for others? It's not about pride. It's not about patting ourselves in the back and saying, oh boy, I did a great thing today. I, 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 uh, I did this thing at church or I helped clean up at a, a work bee or anything like that. It's about simply embracing a very simple concept in our lives. God comes to all of us in our lives at some point, and he offers us his blessing. I think he comes to us all, as he did in Solomon's dream. Ask what you wish me to do for you. What can I do for you? He lo- he's a father. The Bible says that he's that good father that wants to come to his children and do good things for us. He comes to us all at some point in our life, many, maybe multiple times, maybe in, in, in a variety of times. It might be in dreams. It might be through different people in our lives. But he says, ask what you wish me to do for you. How will you respond? And how will you embrace the wisdom of Solomon and embrace a kingdom mentality? Help me, God. Help me to bless your people. Help me to have the same spirit of Solomon, the same spirit of Christ, who's willing to give up good things so that others can be saved. If not now, win how much longer of earth's history do we need to go through before we get serious about being about God's business in the last days how many more crises do we need what is God asking of you today the yoke of Christian service oh excuse me the yoke of service Christ himself has borne in humanity he said I delight I delight to do thy will O God O my God yea thy law is written within my heart I came down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him that sent me love for God zeal for his glory and love for fallen humanity brought Jesus to earth to suffer and die this was the controlling power of his life this principle he bids all of us to adopt and I offer it to you today have a kingdom first mentality. Let's pray. God in heaven, none of us have arrived, Lord. No matter how long we've been in the faith, no matter how long our journey has been, 
David wasn't perfect. Solomon wasn't perfect. The only perfect example we have is Christ. But through all of these stories, we see lessons and we learn from what you've done in their life. Lord, help us to get serious, all of us. And if, if we're already serious, help us to get more serious. Help us to look around and see that the signs are around us, that this world will not last forever. And that the only thing that matters is your kingdom, which is your people, which is helping everyone come to know that they are a child of God and that they have purpose and that they have beauty and that you died for them just like anyone else. Help us to have that spirit of Christ being willing to sacrifice, sacrifice our time, sacrifice our resources, sacrifice our priorities. And sometimes, Lord, it even may come to sacrificing our lives in the hope that others would be saved. Help us to learn from your example. Help us to be passionate about our walk with you, about our study of the scriptures and the building up of godly character in our lives. Thank you for the ministry of the church, Lord. Thank you that this can be a slice of heaven where we can come together for fellowship, for joy, and for growth. Thank you, Father. We look forward to the good things you're going to do in our life because we're willing to ask of you to make us into this kingdom mentality. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you everyone so much for being here. We have potluck today, so if you're hungry, in just a few moments, we'll be having a great meal next door in our fellowship hall. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next Sabbath and coming to worship with us. God bless.